Okay, so this is, I'm Brian Hurt, and this is Monads and Self Metaphors. And I just want to quick start the uh, slides for those who are interested or up on my GitHub repo. Uh, I sent this to the Lisp NYC mailing list, and it's on, I did a comment up on Meetup so you can get them there. Uh, I will repeat this link at the end of the, the uh, talk, so don't worry about getting it down right at the moment. I'm still downloading OpenOffice, so I can read that. Yeah, <laughs> you do need, they're an open office format, so you do need to download that. Google Drive? So. I just want to start with a quick thing going, you know, why, why should you even care? Um, you probably have heard about monads if you've been listening to programming languages at all. The language Haskell may have come up. And the M word may have been mentioned with that. Monads are actually a useful design pattern beyond even Haskell. Um, Large number of things, large number of cases where you will see monads even in other languages. Um, just a couple of comments. Futures are monad. Um, parser combinators are monad. These are things we will see in other languages even. And the examples I will actually be using as my motivating examples are stuff you will be seeing in other languages. But you can avoid them or at least ignore them in pretty much every other language. It's Haskell that actually forces you to confront them and use them. And you should totally learn Haskell. I'm, I'm an advocate, I admit it. Um, the examples that I will be using, the code I will be using, will actually be in Haskell because it sort of makes the most sense. It's very, very simple, very, very rudimentary Haskell. So even if you've never seen Haskell before, you should be able to pick it up. Uh, Please, if you're confused, if I'm not making any sense, let me know, ask a question. This all makes sense in my head. It doesn't necessarily mean it makes sense to anybody else. Can we correct any errors we find? Yes, but not the guy sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look for errors. I don't look for errors. <laughs> so, it has been commented that writing monad tutorials is a cottage industry in the Haskell programming language community. There are, if you Google them, there are a number of, of monad tutorials out there. So the question becomes, why am I doing another one? And the answer is that all the other ones suck. <laughs> they, are, they are bad tutorials in a lot of ways. And you need to, you really do need to understand monads to, to do much of anything with Haskell. So the question is, why do they suck? The first problem is they love, they, they love to use metaphors, and thus the title of this talk. Um, the classic metaphor is a monad is like a burrito. I think my favorite one was Monads are just like space suits. They protect you from the toxic great waste, but you can just open them up and grab all the apples you want. <laughs> and if you understand that metaphor, you're a better man than I do. <laughs> so my solution is going to be no metaphors. I'm not going to try to give you some vague idea of what monads are. I'm going to give you actual code. We are going to work with real code, or at least stuff that kind of looks like real code. And I want you to get your hands dirty. At the end of the day, the only real way to truly understand monads is to, to work with them, to implement them, to use them, to get your hands dirty, and actually write code. I'm a big proponent of actually writing code. Another problem monad tutorials have, unfortunately, is too much category theory. I'm sorry. I'm not <laughs> I mean, monads are just monads are just monoids in the category of indoor. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> if you actually do understand category theory, you can work through and go, yes, they are actually monoids in the category of endocomptors, but that's the worst possible way to understand monads. So my solution again, no category theory, just code. And the last is impatience. I think one of the big problems is for you just need to, when you're getting introduced to this stuff, you just need to take it slow and go through all of the 
you know, go through in detail. Don't don't skip over stuff. Don't try to go faster. Don't go. Oh, obviously you'll understand this. <laughs> um, monads are they do take advantage of some features, especially in Haskell, which you may not see. They are combinators. They are there will be a lot of playing games with is it a function or is it a data type. And if you're not comfortable and if you're not familiar with that sort of style of coding, it can be very confusing as to what's going on here. So my solution is going to be, I'm going to take it slow, I'm going to unpack everything, I'm going to be very detailed, I'm going to be very picky, finicky about what's going on. And hopefully you will be able to follow the steps if they're if each step is small enough. That makes sense? There are two blog posts on, um, on monads that have really informed this. I don't, think, I don't think either of them is really a good introduction by itself. Um, abstract intuition and the monad tutorial fallacy is all about the bad ways of how not to write monad tutorials. And you could have invented monads, and maybe you already have. It's very much the genesis for this, but I think he picked the wrong first example. And so I'm sort of redoing his introduction, except was what I think is a better, better example. So, yeah, question. So, yes. first we have the monad, then we have the monad tutorial. <laughs> then we have the anti-monad tutorial article. <laughs> and lastly, we have the anti-monad tutorial monad tutorial. Yes! <laughs> and welcome to the anti-monad tutorial monad tutorial tutorial. <laughs> well, before we go totally lost here, I want to start with a motivating example. Just something that we can actually start getting our, getting our hands into. Right, so here's a hunk of code, which you have a function foo. It takes some set of arguments. The ellipses here I'm going to use a lot. This just represents there are some stuff here, but we don't care what it is. So we have function foo. It takes some set of arguments, and it returns some result. right? And in the middle of foo, foo calls bar. Bar takes some set of arguments. The middle of bar it call, calls baz. So we have sort of a a a a a, a, um, a stack of functions here. Foo calls bar, bar bar calls baz. That's the important thing I want you to understand here. We have we have a general we have layers of functions here calling each other, right? Then we discover we're we're happily coding along and it looks pretty good. And then we discover we have a problem. We have some data available only up where we're calling foo that we need down in baz, right? So some, something way up here where we're going to call foo, we need to get all the way down here in baz, down at the bottom of the stack, right? This is a problem that shows up in pretty much every programming language. I think I encountered it programming Pascal in the seventh grade. So dynamically bound common list variables. <laughs> there are a number of solutions to that. That is one of them. Um, the standard solution that works in pretty much all programming languages that we're going to actually look at today is you just pass that new piece of information, whatever it is, all the way through the, all the way through the stack of, of functions. Right? So now we've modified foo. Foo takes whatever arguments it used to take, plus the new argument that we're going to need to pass down. And it needs the new argument only so it can pass it to bar. Other than that, it doesn't care about the new argument at all. And of course, bar needs it. Bar takes the new argument. And bar needs it to pass the baz. And baz needs it because it actually needs to use it here. So now we've had, you know, now we've had to actually modify all of these functions and add yet another argument to just pass it around. We've got to make sure we pass it in the right places. We've got to make sure, you know, it, it, it is the type signatures are updated, et cetera. It's very, this is very error prone. This is very liable to break, even in a type system. And this is very annoying, even with advanced features. 
So you probably have already guessed the punchline here. So I'm just going to step on my punchline really quick and go, this is a monad. You don't see it yet. I do not expect you to see it yet. But this is in fact a monad. We're going to pull a monad out of this. And I'm going to show you why it's a good thing and why it's a useful thing in this circumstance. Right? This is one of the motivations for Yeah, this is one of the motivations for monad. So I want to start by just doing a very simple thing. I'm just going to introduce a new type here. Um, a type declaration in this circumstance, it is exactly like a type def in C or C++. It just, implement, it just, just creates a type alias. And so everywhere where we see new arg a, we can replace that with the function that takes the argument from new arg to a, right? So this is just, we're just literally going to be doing a textual substitution here. So this helps a little bit as it allows us to rewrite our code now. And we've cleaned stuff up a little bit because now our types are a little bit cleaner. Instead of actually having to state that we're doing a new arg, we just return a new arg of some result. And remember, this will then get expanded out into new arg to arrow to foo result. Now, this is one of the places where people get start getting lost really quick here. Is in Haskell, there is no difference between passing a returning a function and having the function just take another argument. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a, in, in a bit. But at the moment, we're just cleaning stuff up here a little bit. It's not even that big of a win, but it will help will help us leverage yet more in a bit. The problem, the big problem is, we're still having to hand, hand pass the new args around. We're still having to go, you know, foo still has to take an extra argument, it still has to be passed into bar, bar has to take another argument to pass to baz. We, we really haven't cleaned the code up all that much. By itself, this isn't that big of a win. But it does start making us think a little bit, like, what, what would a perfect solution be if we could just have anything we wanted at all? How, would this, how might this work? So you might go, a dream solution would be to have a magic let statement in, in, the, in the language. And the magic let statement would just automatically pass the, the, the new arg around. It would just know that there is this new argument that needs to be passed around. And if we had this magic let, we could sit there and we could go, instead of having to pass the arguments around, we could just use the imlet. The, the imlet, which is our magic let here, in place of a normal let here, right? And the magic let would just magically, without any intervention from us, it would automatically go, well, we gotta have the new arg gotta be added to the argument list. So it'll just do that automatically, simply because you used inlet. Um, and it will automatically pass the, the new argument into bar here, simply because you used the inlet. So if we had, you know, if we had our dream language, if we were unconstrained by actual what has actually been implemented, what language are we actually working in? This would be how we would want to do it. Um, I believe, and it would also then recursively automatically add it to and pass it into Baz. Yes. Well, Baz would use the magic let as well, and so it would get added. Okay. And so I will get to that. Um, yes. Just a quick question. When you say that the argument should be passed automatically, when you say that, you imply that all all functions that take a new arg of something. Yeah. That also calls some other function that will take a new arg or something must yes. pass the arg. Yeah. So, it's so the, yeah. So the, the the bar here would have to take the new argument. It just sits so. secretly on the bottom of the stack, not bothering anybody. <laughs> and you have a. So um, I just want to understand uh, the benefits here versus what people have done in this game. But it comes with this notion of declaring a variable dynamic. This is not a global variable. It's yep. a variable that has dynamic scope and indefinite extent. 
Um, the problem with the, uh, the dynamic variables is how do they interact with threats? And believe you me, this has bit me on the ass more than once programming multi-threaded closure. That I bind something in thread A and then I spawn a pass a function to thread B to be executed and then the variable isn't bound. Okay. And so this this will monads will actually let? solve okay. that solution. Okay. Your magic let doesn't solve it. The magic let, no. Okay. Magic let, let, I'm just sort of going, if we had sort of a dream solution that just did everything, that psychically pulled out of our head what we wanted to do instead of actually having to code it, what would it look like? Any people are following? So this is still... So, the reality, unfortunately, now that we had that beautiful dream of a magic let that just did everything for us, Reality is implementing MLEP requires either big changes to the, the compiler or serious template Haskell hacking. And well, that's more than we really want to do. But let's remember that to dream. The dream will come back. But for the moment, let's just pass on and go, what can we do easily without having to do serious compiler hacking? So there's a trick that's fairly well known in the, the functional community, but it's not very often explained. There is, a, there is a transformation, there is an equality, there is an isomorphism, if I want to use a mathematical term, between let and apply. So I can define, stop that. So the expression let var equals expression one and expression two, this just introduces a name that in this case var, that we set equal to expression one when we evaluate expression two. So this is just, this is how we implement local variables basically in functional programming languages. And scheme. And, and scheme and lisp and closure, you know, camel and... Um, the let, this let expression is exactly the same as if I had done the backslash here, this is Haskell for lambda. This is a, I define an inline function that takes one variable, one argument called var, and its body is expression two. And then I take this inline function and I apply expression one to it. These two forms are exactly identical. I can switch back and forth between them and not change the meaning of my, my program at all. You apply it to expression one? Yes. Yeah. So this is, I apply this function to expression one. So expression one is the value I'm passing in. So if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. In both cases, I'm defining a name and assigning a value to it. It's closure. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is, this is just a closure. The, the, the backslash is going to be just, that's how, that's how Haskell introduces closures. Lambda. It's a, it's a lambda. It's a lambda. Yes. If you know, if you know list, it's a lambda. Um, I knew you were going to do parentheses. Single leg. So, so this, this equality is sort of it's well understood in the field, but it's not often explained. So it's a very useful thing to know. By the way, GHC will happily go both directions when optimizing its code. It will. Just, it will happily put stuff, you, you will define it as a let and it will go, no, it's better defined if I create a, a, a lambda expression. Or even more often, simply because you created a lambda expression, it, it will go, no, I think I'm going to convert that back into a let because it's more efficient to compile. So, given this, e given this equality, the nice thing about looking at it as in terms of an apply operation instead of a let is, we can change and apply, we can cause, we can create a function called apply that just applies the, the function to the argument. And we can, then, we can then replace that function with another function. So we can now. Call, not list apply. Yeah. yeah. So now we can go m apply or magic apply function we can replace apply with magic apply without having to rewrite the whole dang compiler. 
that's the whole point of doing this trick, is that now we can start playing games with stuff. Now we can start swapping out definitions without having to rewrite the whole dang compiler. Well, I commented about this a little bit earlier, but I want to go into it a little bit greater detail um, because it is going to be important, which is partial functions, which is another thing that Haskell does a lot of, and you see a lot of with monads, that you don't see a lot of in other programming languages. Not even, uh, you see it a fair bit in OCaml, but it, it, it's possible, but it's rare in like the list, closure, etc. Um, we will be doing a lot of it in this presentation, which is partial functions. Yeah, is not partial functions. Yeah. Um, and we will be using them to do the part, to do the magic add, where we want to just add parameters to a, a function. And we will also be using partial functions to magically pass in the value. So to, to implement our magic apply, which is the variant of our magic let, we'll be using a lot of partial functions. So I want to just spend a little time talking about partial functions and partial function application. So in Haskell, functions are values that can be passed around, just like ints and strings and other pieces of data. The other interesting thing is all functions only take one argument. They only ever take one <coughs> argument. And you're probably already going, wait a minute, Brian, this makes no sense. I saw you just a couple of slides ago having a function taking two arguments. Apply takes two arguments. What are you saying? You only take the single argument, right? So what the heck am I talking about here? Well, a function with two arguments it doesn't actually take two arguments. It takes one argument. Now it returns a function that takes one argument and returns the value. So that's how we get around the, oh, functions only take one argument. How do they take two arguments? You pass a function, it returns a function. So you could literally go, oh, a slight typo here. Instead of foo, you could have it be foo x, y equals something. That is the equivalent of just saying here, so we have foo x, y equals something. That looks like it's taking two arguments. This is exactly the equivalent of if you had said this, where foo takes one argument, and it returns, this backslashes our lambda, remember. This, this returns a function, a closure, that grabs the x, and it takes a y, and it does the same whatever. Does this make sense? Yeah, but this is one of the most important points, I think, when you're teaching people something like this, things, the syntax like that. That, that top thing, right, there's two yeah. ways to parse it. But as you go down the page, you explain there's this rigorous convention in Haskell, and in most languages like it. But, you know, the, the, that's how you add the parentheses. Yeah. Yeah. And if you add them the other way, you get a completely different thing. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, good point. Yeah, yeah. That the 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 right the, the the arrow here on types binds to the right. So this type is the equivalent of this type, and that is something that's going to show up a lot in this in this in this thing in this talk as well. And it has to be allowed to put permanent so around such things. Yeah. yeah. Could have food and time. I'm, the arg one goes yeah. to arg two. Parent block. Yeah. And then go to arg. Could have. Yeah. Just, yep. just and I will, and I, and I, by the way, and I will happily go from types of this sort to types of this sort later on in the talk. So if you're, if you're, if you're lost, now is the time to speak up because I can find you again and we can move forward. <laughs> okay, looking good. This is this is tricky stuff. This is not like most other programming languages. Yes, a question. It's probably worth mentioning those who aren't familiar with Haskell that R1, R2, and R vowel are type names. Yeah, yes. So this is yeah. I should I should introduce that as well. The double anything with double colon here <coughs> that's going to be a type that's going to be defining the type for the next thing. So this this line here, I'm defining the type for foo, <coughs> and then this will define the body for foo. Right. So consequence number one of 
doing things this way and pulling this trick is that there is no difference between returning a closure, returning a function, and adding arguments to the current function. Right? I can, I can sit there and I can, up to and including going, I do some stuff and then I return a closure that binds, you know, that binds that stuff. Haskell will happily, by the way, just go, I'll just promote that argument all the way up and add it to the main function because there's no behavioral difference. You won't notice, the only difference is performance. So you won't, you won't calculate a different answer based on GHC doing this or not, right? So that allows us to do the magic, add the arguments to the, to, to the argument list. We have a question, yes. In this, we do need to have the nested lambdas, uh, and, and like, in, we need to explicitly to say, here I want more arguments, and here uh, Yeah. So in this, I will have explicitly have partial and I can't just let the partial Yes. Explicitly defined by yes, list, list, were, list requires you to actually have it the explicit lambdas, and it does make a difference on, on evaluation. Um, you think you want to partial functions to the Yeah. That's your yeah. point, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and you, you well, can do whatever you want, but list makes, makes the multiple value, the multiple argument system simple. And yeah. The other will work fine if you change the standard library to make them work. Just yeah. So we don't. Yeah, and that is one of the downsides to doing this, is Haskell does not allow you to have a, an unlimited number or variable number of arguments to a function. You've got to know how many how arguments are to the function at some point. So consequence number two, and this is, this is yet another one that we're going to be seeing a fair bit of, and this is different from most other programming languages. But I can apply too few arguments to a function. And what you get back, if the function takes two arguments, I can apply one argument to it. And what I get back is a function that takes one argument. It's exactly like I was returning a lambda expression. It returns a closure, even if it doesn't do anything other than just capture the variable. So it's perfectly okay if you have a function that takes five arguments to only apply three to them, and you end up with a function, and the result is a function <coughs> that takes two more arguments before it goes and does something. Does that make sense? Again, this is not stuff you see often, even in languages like Lisp. It's, it's doable, but it's not a very common thing. And we're going to be doing a fair bit of it this evening. So, so now I can sit there and I can start actually trying to implement my M apply. So assume I already have an M apply, right? And the first thing I want to point out is I have swapped the argument to M apply to make it more like the lap. So we originally had you apply f and then you apply x to make it look like an apply, that the function comes first and then the value you're applying. We're doing it the other way around this time. We're doing the argument we're applying and then the function. Because this does make it look a little bit more like the our, our, our dream of having the magic let. So we can sit there and we can go m apply, here is bar, We've applied bar to too few arguments here. Remember, bar still takes the new bar still takes the new argument. So applying bar to too few arguments here means we get back a function that will take an argument. And then we have then we have the, the actual body for the second part of the body for foo. I'm getting ahead of myself. So it's the application of bar to a few arguments that generates the partial? Yes. And that's yes. So by who's, what function is actually responsible for applying? The, M apply will M, yeah, M apply will will go and apply the last arguments to it as necessary. We'll apply so that when new argument. Compiling this, it's when the compiler is compiling call to the apply that the partial code to generate partial is generated? Yeah. Um, as opposed to compiling the yeah, you could, yeah, you could you could think of it as it creates a closure, which is just a data structure that holds all of the arguments, okay. and then passes that into mApply. Okay. 
So I'm partial, partially applying, and I got a typo here. I renamed the functions and I didn't get all of them. Uh, bar was originally called G and decided that was a bad name, so I changed it. Um, so I'm partially applying bar to get a new arg. But remember, a new arg is a just the last function, the last argument we need to apply to get to the result, right? And we're passing it to m apply. And I'm still recalling it's g down here. I apologize. So this allows m apply will actually pass the, the value. Uh, question, yes? So when, this is going back a little bit. Um, but yes. the, the new arg typed up, um, was that the new arc that was inside that type def, is that a concrete function or is that a type? That's just a type. The new arg is just, remember, new arg is just our type alias to new arg arrow whatever. Capital new arg is a type alias for lowercase new arg to A. Yes. <laughs> Capital N new arg A is, is a type alias to lowercase new arg to and that A. Lowercase new arg is a is the actual type of whatever value we need to pass down to it. Okay. That makes sense? Yes. I, it all makes sense in my head. Whether it makes sense on the slide or not is open to debate. So, um, so I'm applying new arg, applying bar to get a new arg. And the other, another thing to notice is foo is now sort of split into two parts here. You got the part before we would call bar, and we have the part after we call bar. And the part after we call bar, we're actually packaging up in another closure to pass into, pardon me, to pass into mapply that we're hoping at least mapply will call at some point when it actually gets after it calls bar and gets whatever bar's return is going to be. Does that make sense? But we got a lot of closures flying around here. This is not something you see in most other languages. Question, yes? I feel like I'm kind of lost, or possibly because I'm not used to relying on the type signature so much in, in mapply. Um, but I guess also, at least immediately, my question is, when you have the mapply bar bar args, the next thing is, so, uh, sorry, in, in down in foo. OK. So you have mapply bar bar args. Yeah. Then the next line, the lambda arg. The lambda R. So this does, is. Does that correspond to in the type signature of M apply A to B? Yes. Okay. So this closure right here is going to be the A to B we turn in here. So B is going to be, you know, A is going to be whatever bar returns. It's the type of whatever bar returns. And B is going to be a foo result. Does that make sense? Yes. Are you, are you less lost? Than less this? lost. <laughs> Yes, this is this is fairly confusing, and hopefully I go through some more more examples here, so you, you will be able to see how this stuff works. This is closures are flying hot and heavy here. And we're introducing closures and applying closures and partially applying closures. This is one of the things that does get confusing with with monads when you're first introduced to monads. So this is your first real introduction to playing games like this with with your code. Can you say that one more time? This this defines this defines a function that takes one argument, which is going to be whatever the result of calling bar will be after we do whatever oh, meant. Because it's before. Yes. Right. Right. So this actually the code will actually flow. That's why I reversed the argument. And so that now the code flows the same way as, you know, it, you know, the way it will get executed, modulo made the evaluation, which I'll go into later. The way the code will be ex executed is the same way it's written. So this part will be called, will be executed. Then mapply will call bar, adding whatever stuff it needs, doing whatever it needs. And then this code will be executed, returning the result, which will percolate all the way back. That um, makes sense. In the mapply, which is the function, which is the value, does bar return a function? Um, bar, new arg, remember, is a function. It's, it's a function of lowercase new arg to, to a. So, 
So What's that will be. Here? Is it the result of bar or is it the closure? This creates a closure oh, okay. of type new arg A. And it's called with and, and yeah. And it, then it gets passed in. Okay. But the closure, since, since new arg A is itself a function, it will be called in M apply when and actually. And apply actually calls it on the second data. Yes. Okay. And then M apply will take the result of having called having called this guy and passed it on to this guy. Right? This is a little bit crazy, but it actually does work quite well. <laughs> and screwing up my names again, I see. <laughs> so yeah. Remember M also here's the interesting thing. M apply returns a new art itself. So that means it's returning a closure. It's returning a closure of type lowercase new art to be. Foo, if you actually look at the structure of foo, what foo says is we, we, when you call foo, it implements a bunch of code, and then it calls mapply, returning whatever mapply returns. So the return value from foo is going to be the return value from mapply, which is going to be one of these new art things. And this code is going to be called somewhere in mapply, we hope. Actually, it will. I'll give you that. So foo here is returning here b, since this code returns a foo result, which is of type foo result, this function b here becomes new result. And so we return a, this call to mapply will return a new r to foo result, which we then just return here. But remember, um, yes, question? Uh, I just want to ask a correlate, uh, a similar question to the one I asked before. Yeah. For, so you assume that every function that is getting modified to serve the new argument calls others that also have the modification. Yes. Now, furthermore, you're assuming that the return value of that function is also the return value of the function you're modifying. Yes. Okay. So if that yeah. were not the case, then that were not the case, you would have a, actually a type error, and the compiler would be going. I have no idea would have what to, to change. We'd have to use that yeah. new argument. So here, uh, uh, yes, question. Uh, not a comment. If you give this talk again, change these things to be concrete types. Yeah. yeah. They're all different. It'll be much clearer. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I actually did think of that, and the 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 downside, the, the two problems with that. One of which I couldn't think of a good example. Um, and the other of which is I didn't want I didn't want you focusing on the example. I wanted you to sort of focus on the patterns and how I'm restructuring the code. Yeah, but you don't have the pattern until you know the example. Otherwise, yeah, you are back to pattern right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, question. Um, in the two comments, which is what f returns and the the one below that. Okay, f, f is, is the original name for foo. Okay. I I, re I went through and renamed and didn't catch all of the names. I apologize. So, I want to make sure it's clear about it. Yes. I apologize. So F is foo, G is bar. <laughs> so, so because M apply returns a new arg, we return a new arg here. But remember, new arg is just a type alias for it takes another argument. So by having returning a new arg here, we are implicitly, magically adding, we take the new argument as well. So, note bar has to do the exact same thing. Bar applying to the bar args, this gets passed in, this will be a new arg A, where A becomes bar result, whatever bar returns. <laughs> so, bar applied to bar args needs to be a new arg as well. So, it needs to take, that was your comment, it needs to take the extra argument. And because we're returning it here, we take the new argument as well. And in practice, so, because of type inference, you wouldn't have to do anything because you wouldn't declare it without making it first. Yeah. Group. And check to make sure that everything lines up and you don't actually miss that, oh, I needed to return a new a new arg a, not just an a. Right? Uh, question? No. Well, actually, going back a little bit to your original lambda example, um, did you have a question about that? The, uh, you're using the uh, value of the like the actual value that's passed in when you 
look through somewhere in that, but we don't have a formal parameter to find it. So I'm assuming we're going to get to that at some point, but in, yeah. the, in the function body of that, I don't see how if you're a template, for example. Oh, yes, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm ignoring BAS for the moment. The, the, the question was all the way down at the bottom when we're actually using it, how do we actually get access to this magic variable and how do we actually use that? I, I will cover that in a little bit. And you're right, the MLAT, I was, just, I was ignoring BAS. For the okay. Oh, last comment. We still need an implementation for MLAT. I've been talking about there's this magic function that will do this stuff, but we still need to actually implement the day to day thing. So let's get started on implementing MApply. And I want to introduce a notation here that I, that's very useful. It helps when you have lots of type aliases and you're doing some, you know, your types are not non-trivial, to sort of unroll all of the type aliases and to go, what type is this really? And this will become even more important as we start playing serious games with are we returning a function or are we returning a value depending upon what, you know, we will swap back and forth depending upon where we are and what we feel like at the time. So it helps to know what are the actual types going on here. So I'm going to put the type unrolling in a green font. So anything you see in green is basically a comment. If you're writing real code, you wouldn't write this because then the compiler would sit there and go, why are you giving me three types, types for this function? Um, but it helps to sort of understand what's going on. Now I'll give you an immediate example of that. Let's take a look at mApply. <laughs> I should have actually done this slide much sooner, so. Let's take a look at new mApply. So mApply takes new arg A to an A to B to a new arg B. But new arg, remember, is just our type alias for new arg to A. So here, you know, I explicitly say, I give the original type here. I unroll it here. I just replace all the new arg A's with new arg 2A and new arg 2B. Now remember, arrows binds to the right. The earlier comment, arrows binds to the right. So I can take this last argument. If I take two functions and I'm returning a function, well, I can just drop these parentheses here and get to this type, which is I take a function and a function and a new arg, and I return a b. Does this make sense? All I'm doing, all I'm doing here is I'm dropping the parentheses because the precedences are right, and this makes exactly the same type. They must be able to do it left too. Um, no. Oh. You actually, these parentheses you do need because they're actual functions them. you're passing in. Yeah. If I got rid of them here, then it would be yeah. <laughs> it, it'd be completely different. Completely yeah. different function. It would be better to use a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a burrito. <laughs> the, the, these are our wrapping for our burrito. Really. <laughs> a man's reach and exceed his grasp for what's a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> so. At this point, no. So you have guacamole. <laughs> yes, I have the guacamole types here. So I have a type that looks like it's a function that takes two arguments and returns something. I'm going to write it as a function that takes three arguments. I'm going to go. I'm going to assume you've already passed the new arg in, right? And so now I have I have a new arg. And I have a function that goes from new arg to A, a function that goes from A to B, and I need to return a B. So how do I construct the B? Well, if I call X, which is this guy, with the new arg I've been passed in, that gives me an A, which I can then just pass to F, which is this guy here, to give me a B, that I can just return. Yes, it's amazing. It, you, you can go quite a long ways to basically going, I have this type, I need that type, how do I, uh, just on types, how do I get from point A to point B? And it's amazing how often that yields the correct code. 
And this is one of the instances where, oddly enough, this actually does yield the correct code. That note that we are now piping the new arg down into x here. Remember, x here will be our call to bar that's already had the arguments to bar applied. So now we just apply new arg. So this actually will then execute bar. f will be the second part of our foo example. Once we've finished executing bar, we can then call foo and return it. Does this make sense? Uh, question? So here you are implementing a read-only state monad or something? Yes. Okay. This is the reader monad, if, you, if, you, if you've already noticed it. Okay, okay. You caught me palming that card, didn't you? <laughs> so one important thing <laughs> I've already pointed out is are we taking an extra argument or are we turning a function? Yes, doesn't make a difference. We'll happily switch back and forth between them and everything will simply work correctly. <laughs> so this is, I've already gone through, this is the partially applied bar, this is the second part of foo. So isn't adding an extra R what you're trying to avoid? Yes, but this allows me to do it automatically. So now, now that I have my magic apply and my new arg a, I can just go, eh, just return a new arg a instead of an a. So this is where new arg gets magically passed into bar. It's not really automatic. It's just hidden under the syntax issue. Yes. <laughs> you still have to re you still have to touch every line of code. It's just that you touch them in a uh, cool way instead of just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and there are advantages, and I will go into the advantages in a little bit. This is where the second part of foo is called. So this works fairly well, but there is a problem. There are actually several problems. I'm going to start with this problem. What happens if we want to m apply, magically apply multiple function, mul you know, multiple times in the same function, right? So we have a foo here. This is an alternate foo where we want to call. There are two different bars we want to call, bar one and bar two. And we want to magically apply bar one, and it gets some result. And so this is the whole second part of, of foo here. In the second part of foo, we want to call bar two, with some set of arguments, and do exactly the same thing here. Well, now foo is sort of in three parts, this part, this part, and this part doing exactly the same stunt we were doing before, we're just doing it twice the same function. All right? So this runs us into a slight bit of problems. I'm going to actually spell out the types and let people follow through the types. So this function, this value down here, we're returning a type of foo result all the way down here. We want to start, start making the code red as I, I talk about whole subparts of the code make it obvious what parts I'm talking about, right? So down here, we are, we are returning a foo result, right? But that means this whole closure here, backslash means a closure again. This whole closure has bar two result, whatever bar two returns, to foo result, right? So this is, we're doing the magic apply, so magic apply will pass whatever the result of this is, We'll apply this function with the result of calling bar. So this will have type bar two results to foo result, right? So that means the return type of the whole m apply, this whole last m apply, is going to be a new arg foo result. So that's exactly what we were doing in the last function, right? But now people should start getting a little bit worried here. So that means this whole closure has a type bar one to do result, right? Because it's what, you know, m apply is going to actually call bar one and pass it in here. So r one is going to be whatever bar one returns, right? And so this is going to have a bar one result to a new arg boot result. So that means, and this is where things start going seriously off the rails, <laughs> the result of this whole m apply, a, a is, you know, a, you know, the type b here is going to be the, the value returned from m apply 
going to be new arg of new arg of foo result. Which means this whole function has type whatever argument we pass in to new arg, new arg foo result. That's not what we wanted. We wanted to just new arg foo result, not new arg of new arg of foo result. So from the type C issue perspective, what does new arg of new arg of foo result mean? That means we actually added the, the, the parameter twice. So this will be this will be lowercase new arg arrow to lowercase new arg arrow to foo result. That's actually a very good question. Uh, question? Is it necessarily the case that it would be the same, the new org would have to be the same type in this case? They could be different types, right? Yeah, if you, yeah, if you, if you did a different M apply, if you did magic applies, you could have all sorts of weird. In this case, they could. Yeah, in this case, I'm, I'm only doing, I'm only doing the new org, so it's all just new org with new args. Right? So I won't go through the whole de derivation here, but the, the fundamental problem here, we had the wrong type for mapply. When we passed in a function, we said it just takes an A and it returns a B. And then the result of mapply will then be the B. Right? It will be, will be new arg of B. What we wanted to do, we wanted to go A to new arg of B and just have magic apply go, we should only apply the, the extra argument once. We shouldn't apply it however many times we call them apply. We should only apply the new argument once. That makes sense? So that allows us to implement M apply, our new implementation of M apply. Right? Where the important thing is, is that note we have the new second type for our, for for the uh, the second argument type. Yeah. Now instead of being an A to B, it's an A to new arg to B. Right. That means we have to pass new arg in as the second argument to F as well. There's a question. Um, in retrospect, this should have been more obvious from the get go because we said we wanted to thread the argument through all of our functions. Yes. Yes. That is exactly the problem we're running into. Is we're not threading it into the second part of, of, of foo as well. But we're going, what this is explicitly saying here is the second part of foo needs the, the, the extra argument as well, not just the first part of foo. We need to pass it in. So here, no. We have a we have a new arg to a. I've, I've unrolled the types again, so it's important to actually read the types. So new arg becomes new arg to a. So our passed in function becomes an a to a new arg to b. Right? I can drop the parentheses here as well because arrow binds to the right. So this type is exactly the same as this type, and this type is exactly the same as this type. Right? So I have a I have a new arg here. I have a new arg to A, so that gives me an A. But F is A to new arg to B. So I need to pass not only the A I got back from X, which will be which is bar in our example, actually calling bar, we also have to pass in the new arg there as well. People still following? Mm -hmm. yeah. This still doesn't solve the problem perfectly, but now we have a problem here. Uh, down here, this is our, our multi-call to m apply foo here. This closure has a type of bar two result to foo result. Right? When it needs to be a bar two result to new arg foo result. M applied wants to pass the new arg into this code as well, and this code doesn't, isn't taking it. Right? Well, so um, one thing I was about this one time is why do you actually need to call M applied? 
why can't you just write the first argument of another five followed by the second one? I'm not sure I understand the question. Because it does something different from that. That's just yeah. that's just fun calling. That's just yeah. application. This is doing more than fun calling. Yeah, go flip back to the definition of I'm, I'm applying. You see that it does more than fun calling. Considerably. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, oh, sorry. The question is why aren't I just using normal uh, normal apply? And that's because I'm doing extra stuff inside okay, so mapply to pull the stuff around. Right? So. We could just have two different M applies, one of which takes A to new R to B and one of which takes A to B. Or we could have one M apply, which was actually how we want, because M apply is not going to be trivial in several future examples. And we could just supply a fix up function. And all the fix up function does is it takes some value A and it turns it into a new R gay. By now note, remember new arg A is just new arg to A. So again, is this a function of one argument returning a value or a function of two arguments? We'll flip back and forth happily without breaking a sweat. So fix up just returns a closure that ignores what you pass into it and just returns A. Right? So just this, this you know, this just lets us fix up after the fact and go, okay, you're passing in the new arg to me, but I don't care, so I'm just going to ignore it and throw it away. The underscore, by the way, is the discard argument that says to, to Haskell, yes, there's an argument here, but I'm not going to use it, so just ignore it and throw it away. Question. Uh, is that why in Haskell you actually do have that apply underscore? Is that why it's named that way? Oh, um, no, M apply underscore is a completely different okay. function. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> I had forgotten there was a name collision there. I should have named it M apply something else. There is, in fact, a Haskell function called M apply, and there's an M apply underscore that actually does deal with monads, but it's not this. And just to be clear, what you're saying here is that when you do have that kind of composition that would result in new org, new org, yeah. this signature will get found automatically. Yeah, well, this signature. Will you, will you have to call fix up? Yes, we're going to have to call fix up. Um, exactly right here, in fact. <laughs> so what we need to do is all the way down here, instead of just returning foo result, we need to return fix up foo result. To get rid of the WC of Yeah. So this is so what you're saying is that really it's a monoid with a category of endo. Exactly. <laughs> and you're the only person in the room who actually understands that definition, including the guy giving the talk. <laughs> so the fix up just goes, it returns a function of, remember, we were going fix up returns closure that ignores its argument. So this allows us to go, this now types, type check, this now returns. And a, a new new RNA type. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. Now for the sleight of hand. <laughs> the card I have palmed is now coming out of the deck. <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to wait. Can you go back? Sorry, go back. Oh, sorry. sorry. Now we call fix up foo result here sorry. because <laughs> fix up. Remember, fix up foo result returns a function of one argument. That ignores what gets passed in and, returns for, for and just returns foo result. So that means this whole closure oh, now has. That's, that's applied code. So that, yeah, that, yeah, that's. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. In Haskell, if you just see two arguments separated by nothing more than a space, that's I'm applying the second argument to the first argument. Yeah. <clears throat> that makes sense? Yeah. So I'm going to rename m apply to greater than greater than equal, which is pronounced bind, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to rename fix up to return. So what did you rename to bind? M apply. M apply. Ah. So our magic apply function is now called bind. And our magic fix up function is now called return. Now they have exactly the same types, 
and exactly the same definitions. One gotcha I got here, actually, yeah. Um, this is, actually ignore that for a moment. This is a convenient way Haskell allows you to actually define operators. And so I can actually go, okay, this is an operator x bind f means this code. And note, the result of a bind is in fact a closure. So I have an operator here that's returning a function. You might think operators just return values like plus and minus and times. Functions but, are, but then functions can, are values. Right. Functions are values. <laughs> and so. we're used to that list. <laughs> So, uh, question. Just say what, I mean, this, this is really quite a while we literature. The word operator is used in programming language theory, informal and formal. Um, it just means some syntactic things. Yes. It's just a syntactic thing. Yes. And somehow, it's really for me, it's like, what the hell is this mistake? I mean, you just write it in fix. Yes. It's approximately what's meant. Now, it's not quite true. Actually, it's fairly close to being. It's true. very close to being true. So there's nothing mysterious here. Um, a propos of nothing in Haskell, you can take any function name, right. enclose it in backticks, and have it be in fix. <laughs> so you will actually see x backtick foo backtick y. Oh. That's exactly the same as going foo x y. I'm not doing that in this example, so don't worry about it. Uh -huh. But Literally, the definition of operator pretty much means it's in fix, it's not it's a prefix. Purely syntax. <laughs> it's purely syntax. It's purely syntax. not. Haskell folks do that too. Right? Yes. <laughs> so the last thing we want is to be looking like this. <laughs> yeah, we hate currents. <clears throat> so the bind operator returns a function. So this is just a closure that takes yet another argument. Well, we hate operator principles so big. <laughs> yeah, we really do. Yeah. Haskell people love it. Yeah. Oh, you know, Haskell people love operators. Yeah. Uh, Borg only knows how many operators. So this actually allows us to rewrite our code in a much <coughs> nicer and cleaner way. So this is our this is our example. I'm ignoring Baz again for the moment. So now we can just go. Okay, foo takes foo args and returns new or foo result. And it does some code, and then it takes bar, partially applies some arguments to bar, maybe, and binds it to a closure, which then it can do the rest of its code, and it just does, and at the very end, it does a return foo result. A tricky thing to be watch out here for, remember, return is not a keyword, return is a function. Mm -hmm. And Haskell, return is a function. Pretty much every other programming language you know, return is a keyword that does magic states. Here, it's simply a function. Right? And we can do exactly the same thing with bar as well. And this actually looks fairly clean, fairly close to our original code, our, using our magic lab. Right? So an important thing here, the definition of a monad is a little bit more complicated than this, but it basically boils down to anything that implements bind and return in a reasonably sane way. <laughs> um, monad laws may get mentioned at some point, but don't worry about that. Anything that implements bind and return is a monad. So new org is a monad because we've implemented bind and return. And we can interpret the returns mean kind of just clean up the habit. Yeah. yeah. A return just literally lifts the value up into the monad. So it's the flattening. Yeah. Part of it. Or the unflattening actually. Okay. So bind and the return is the return. Yeah. Because I've heard monads described as sort of like flattening functions. Sort of like yeah. <laughs> Yet another. Go metaphors. <laughs> um, uh, why, why, not, why not show the monad laws if you want to be explicit and just say, a monad is these two functions if they obey because these two law, the laws. Okay. Because most people don't write their own monads. The monad laws are insultingly obvious. Yeah. As long as you only use monads, <laughs> as long as you only use monads, you don't need to know what they are. <laughs> oh, no. The answer is, yeah. I actually did have a section earlier on the monad laws. 
Um, short answer, by the way, if you get into, if you ever see an argument on, online about whether or not such and such actually implements the Monad laws, um, if the word if the word bottom is mentioned in the whole conversation, just run away. Go go debate gun control or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is no good there. Yeah, if anything, I would say that no, like no, no implementation of the Monad laws is there. Because like if you hold the laws in your hand, what you're trying to learn about Monad actually easy, it could be yeah. you because you keep trying to fit it into the idea of these laws, but that's not yet important. Yeah, the the, the laws basically go. <laughs> <laughs> <don't>. <laughs> Paraphrasing that you're saying, a monad is if you provide a way to combine these functions with added arguments, yeah. and a function that drops that added argument, then you have a monad. It's actually even more general than that. Yes, everything that works like that is a monad. It's actually more general than that. Lots of things are monads. When you step the cheese into the burrito, the you have a way to get people. the cheese out of the burrito. <laughs> But it, it's a very accurate thing to go. A monad is a design pattern for an interface. Like we talked about with The way I like to think of monads is something that has that the representation of side effects. And which monad do you represent the side effects that are allowed? And so for the reader monad, the side effects that are allowed is read the magic value that, that uh, read the magic configuration value of the, the, the implicit value. And for a state monad, uh, the side effects are either read the state or write the state. And for the non, whatever, non determined monad. You're, uh, you're, you're stepping on my punchlines, but yeah. <laughs> Basically, it's a neutral trait side effect. I have only one kind of, or any kind of side effect that are allowed, and that's what my monad will be uh, something that implements just the side effect that are allowed for, for this particular kind of thing. We'll get to that. So another problem that you may have been noticing, I've been tap dancing past, is the foo and bar functions don't care about the new argument being passed. So long as it gets passed around and threaded in and passed down as necessary, they're just fine. They don't actually need to see this value. They just need to pass it along. Baz, on the other hand, does need to see this value, because that's the whole point of the exercise, that we want to get it down to Baz. And we'd like to do this in such a way that you don't need to know how new arg is actually implemented. We want new arg to sort of be from, from outside. You know, we want to have a module that defines new arg and bind and return and maybe a couple of other functions uh, that operate on new args. And outside of that module, you know, in that module, we know it's a function. Outside of that module, it's just a magic value we're passing around, and we don't know how it's actually implemented. Right? So, Baz, so an important thing here is Baz should not need to know that new arg is actually a function. Foo and bar already don't care. Baz should not need to know. Right? So, the solution that we just define a new function called ask. And yes, I'm palming that card as well, <laughs> right? And so ask is just of type new arg, uppercase new arg to lowercase new arg, right? <coughs> Implementing this is really trivial. Once we unpack that, new arg a is just a to, you know, new arg to a. So new arg, new arg is just new arg to new arg, which is the identity function. So we could just literally go ask equals ID. It, it literally is that trivial. So the benefit is down here in Baz, we can now write Baz. So the first thing Baz does, you know, Baz takes some arguments and it returns a new arc Baz result. The first thing Baz does is it asks for the value and binds it to this closure that actually contains Baz as a whole. And the closure will get called thanks to the magic bind. Magic bind will pass the new arg in. And we will now have access to the new argument to do with it whatever we need to do in Baz. Does this make sense? <coughs> How the, 
So, ask, ignore the fact that ask is actually the identity function. So, ask is the value new R, capital N new R, lowercase n new R. Should have given those different names now that I'm. It's a bad Haskell habit that we like punning our types and values. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, this creates, this is just a function. You know, this is just a new arg value that we can then pass in to bind that it just magically lifts the whatever the magic argument we're passing around up into so bind will then pass it into us. Okay. Bind is expecting something. Bind is it expecting has to have a certain type. So this new is, and the this type is has to be new arg. Because <laughs> okay. I mean, bind is going to yeah. go to the closure. We want the value for you, though. Make it available. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah well, except well, it's being passed well, in. It's not actually side effects. It's, it's having side effects. Yeah. It's giving bad access to the value. Okay. 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 So it's like the so place will take up the working. Yes. The only reason this exists is to keep the type checker happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, there are valid reasons for it to exist other. I'll get to that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So we can just write BAS. BAS asks for the value, binds the ask of the value to, and then we now have access to the magic value. Yes. Actually, is there a reason we need to ask as opposed to just using it every year? Since we have technical things anyway. Uh, because the fact that it's identity is something we don't know. Right. So this is code inside the new R module that we don't want, that you don't see how this function is implemented. You have this function, but the fact that it's identity is hidden from you. So as it's a not necessarily identity for other Yes. For other monads, it will be, in, you know, for other monads, this functions like this will be very, very different, and very, very, you know, arbitrarily complicated. From a type signature perspective, it looks like it. it from, from the implementation, from the implementation, it just happens to be the identity function. Mm -hmm. But we don't know that from outside the module, from where we're using the value. We don't know that it's the identity function. And it might not be, actually. Um, it actually isn't in how it's implemented in Haskell for various reasons. It's morally equivalent but it's not. <laughs> so now, the other problem is, how do we call foo? Way up at the top of the stack, when we want to kick this whole thing off, how do we call foo? We have the magic value we want to pass all the way down to Baz. How do we stick it in? How do we start the whole chain of, of, of things kicking off, functions kicking off? So again, we define a function. And this is, again, inside the new arg module. So we're not going to see the implementation from outside the, the module, despite the fact it's a very trivial implementation. So we just define a run new arg function that takes a new arg a and a new arg, which is the value to pass in everywhere, and it just returns an a. Right. So up where we're calling foo. We'll, you know, we will call foo with too few arguments and it will return a new arg a. And we will call, we will pass it into this function with the new arg we want to call foo with. And that will kick off the whole tree of function calls at that point in time. So, run new arg, expanding the types out again. Note, now I'm going the other way around. I play this game in both directions. We start with a type here of new arg a to arrow to new arg to a. So this is a function with three arguments. Uh, sorry, a function with two arguments here, a new arg a and a new arg. So I'm going to treat it like a function of one argument of a new arg a that returns a function. And so now the fact that these two types are the same means the implementation is, again, the identity function. But we don't want this information leaking out to the outside world. So we're going to actually supply a run new arg function that just impl is implemented as the identity function. Does that make sense? 
right? And so we could then call foo by just going run new args. Foo was the rest of our the normal arguments there, and the new arg we want to pass into the whole whole shebang. Now, it however only takes one argument negatively. Yes. But yet here we are calling it with two arguments negatively. Or not negative. Well, what does that no, mean? No, we're, we're, we're only calling it with one argument. We're calling it with an argument that is itself a closure. Oh, right, because the application binds to the left. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the arrows bind to the right. So the application uh, binds to the left. But so application like, binds to the right. Run new words of the call to foo. Yes. No, there are no actual arguments here. I'm just literally going, when, when you say run new org here, the compiler replaces that with ID. Yeah, the reason that works is that you're calling id on the call to foo, which is just yes. the same as calling foo. Yes. That, that comes back with a function, yes. which we then apply new org to. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. <laughs> so we're playing serious fun and games with closures here. It seems like <laughs> the whole thing is like very brittle. You know, if, if every feature in the language were exactly right, it wouldn't work at all. <laughs> well, it's only a couple of features that needs to be right. right. And, and types do help a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, writing this sort of code in a dynamically typed language, well, now, yeah. um, from experience. <laughs> so one final card I want to shuffle out of the deck magically. This was the comment made earlier. Yes, this is in fact the reader monad. This is in your standard library, standard Haskell library as a control monad reader, right? And so I'm going. The type reader A actually has two type variables, which is an R to an A. And this allows us to do readers with different magic values we're passing around. So this stack of functions we pass, need to pass this type around. That stack of functions we need to pass a different type around. We can use the same code in both places. That makes sense. So it's a reader that only gets to read one thing. It's not a reader yes. that reads lots of things one at a time. Yes, it's a reader that only gets to read one thing. Okay. It works exactly like you have exactly one list of variable in your scope that you can bind. And there were, unfortunately, the, the talk ran long. There was going to be how, how do you have multiple readers if you can read multiple things. Um, Monad transformers for those who are interested. but. That's a got left off of this talk. So how are we doing for time? Um, um, okay, um, I'm going to go long then. I'm going to skip intermission. <laughs> Pardon me. I want to do another motivating example. This one will be much shorter because it's basically exactly the same stunt, except we're going to instead of just passing a value or in. Baz is going to want to add a new, wants to return an updated value for it. So not only will Baz be reading this, but Baz will also be returning a new value. This is actually very common in functional programming languages because with immutable data, um, <coughs> how you, you, know, you have an immutable map of keys to values, you want to add that. How that works is you get a new map, which is have the old map plus the new binding if you add it if you want to add a key value binding to a map. So if Baz is if the magic value is a map and Baz just wants to add a binding, it needs to be able to return a here is the new map. Now this is not as inefficient as it sounds for various reasons, but that's not this presentation. So now if we were to do it by hand and just thread the variable around. In addition to every function, in addition to taking a new arg at the next parameter, it would have to return a tuple. This is how you do multiple value return in Haskell, if you return a tuple. It allows you to return two values and just go, it's the foo result, whatever we would return normally, and the updated new argument, which we get because we pass the, 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 the main one into new, in, down here into bar, and bar is also going to now have to return a tuple as well. And it's going to return a tuple of whatever it would normally return plus the updated 
new value, etc. And down at, at down at Baz, Baz would actually go, here's the new value I want you to return as its tuple. Does this make sense? Please tell me it doesn't actually allocate these tuples. Almost never, no. Okay. Um, it uses cons. <laughs> it doesn't use cons. It doesn't use help. cons, it uses continuation passing. Good. And this stuff just Actually, when it's not using continuation passing, it just returns it to, to register. If you look at the compiler, it uses um, so, so we need we need the new value passed in, so we can pass it into bar. So bar can return us the updated value, so that we can return it back up to where we were calling. This is even more ugly and even more error prone than the original example is. So how are we going to solve this problem? Exactly the same way we solved the last problem. Second verse, same as the first. A little bit faster, a little bit worse. <laughs> so I'm just going, I'm not even going to bother to palm the card. I'm just going to start talking about the state monad. A state monad, and again, this is just the type alias of an SA this is two type variables here, it's parameterized and two type variables. The S is the value we're passing in and getting the updated value back. The magic value we will want to thread through all of our code. And the A is whatever we would be returning normally. This is exactly the same stuff that we were doing with new art before. We're just using a little bit more complicated. Well, we can define bind fairly easy with our new data type, right? So bind takes a state SA and a function from A to state SB, switch the arguments again, and it returns a state SB. And unrolling the types again, remember state SA is just S to A of S, A to S of B of S, returns an S to B of S. Dropping the unnecessary parentheses, we get pass then a function of s to a to s, a function that takes two arguments, an a and an s, to a b of s, and it takes an s and it goes to a b of s. b and s. b and s, no, yes. Yeah. This is a tuple. Yeah, this is a tuple. The comma means it's a tuple. So it's just multi-value return. Right? So we have an a x here is our type s to a of s. Actually, sorry. The bind operator returns a function again. <coughs> so we're going to define bind immediately. It returns a closure of some type S. That's how we get operators with three arguments passed into them. X has type S to A comma S. So it returns the updated, its value and the updated state. F, which is the second part of foo, remember, takes both an A and an S and returns a B and an S, which is what we need to return. So this is, we're just magic, we're just threading the variables through and keeping track, oh, this returned a, a tuple, not a, not just a value. And likewise, oh, one, one important point here, we need to pass in the updated state, the S prime, not the S, <laughs> so that the call to bath, the call to bar can actually update the state so that if it, if you get called multiple times, it will get, yeah, the state will continue getting updated. And return again, second verse, same as the first. It just lifts, it just converts a type A into a type state SA for any S. We don't care because we're not going to be changing it, right? Um, so this takes, this convert, uh, is it a function that takes one argument or a function that takes two arguments? Eh, it depends upon what we feel like. And note, we need to actually return a tuple here. So in the reader case, we could just ignore the value we were passed in. In this case, we actually do need it because we need to return the fact that we didn't change it. Make sense? So again, Remember, the definition of a monad is anything that implements bind and return sufficiently sane. So we've defined bind and return, therefore state is also a monad, right? And we can call foo, 
How do you define the state? How do you do what? I mean, what state? state? The state? The well, definition the of this. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's a function state. state. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah. So now we can define foo cleanly again. Actually, this will look very similar to what we wrote earlier, except instead of new arg or reader, it returns state of new arg. And we just call bar with the extra functions. And note, we're not having to deal here with the fact that bar is actually returning a tuple. In here, we're not passed in a tuple, we're just passed in an R, so we can ignore the fact that it's a tuple, that there is an extra bit of information being passed around here. And we just need to do a return at the end. The state right. is not a function. The state is a parameterized type. The state is a parameterized type that is implemented as a function. Yeah. Again, you notice I've been ignoring baz. In order to write baz, we actually need two functions. We need get, which is our equivalent of ask from before. And we need put. Get reads the current state, effectively. Put writes the state and goes, here is the updated state. So, no, get does not change the state. It just returns the current state. So here, no, get is a value. Once we expand out the type, it's an S to tuple of S and S. So it just goes from S to a tuple of S and S. So allowing us to do bind. Put is a little bit more interesting. Put is passed in two states, right? It's passed in the new state, which is what we want the states to become. And then it's passed in the old state of what the state was when we called the function, which we want to ignore and just throw away, right? And again, I'm playing serious games here. How many arguments are in the function? <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes I want to act as if it's a value. Sometimes I want to act as if it's a function. Same trick as before. So this allows me to write my baz function fairly simply and fairly cleanly, right? Same trick as before with, with, with the reader monad. First thing we do is we do a get that allows us to have access to the old value of this state. Then we can do whatever the heck we want. And when we're done, you know, in here we have access to the current value of the state. And when we're done, we call put to actually write the new value back out and put it back into the magic, magic parameter. And we do it this way. This is a little bit more clunky way to do it than you might think is necessary. We do it this way, again, so that we don't have to know what the underlying implementation actually is. Well, it also makes it look like you had a variable with a side effect, except you didn't. Yes. This is acting exactly like we had some bit of global mutable state that we could read and write, happy as a clam, except it really isn't. We're just passing a bit parameter around. It's not global. It's threaded in and out. It's threaded in and out, it's yes. It's not global. Yes. So finally, how do we call foo up at the top, right? How do we actually kick the whole thing off? Well, we just have a run state. Again, it's going to be very trivial, but we don't want to expose the fact that it's trivial. We don't want to expose that it's a function underneath. So run state is of type S, state SA to an initial state, and it returns whatever the value was that was returned and whatever the last write to put was, whatever the last state, final state was. Right? Expanding out the types again just becomes S to A of S to S to A of S. And I'm again playing the trick of adding and subtracting parentheses happy as a clam so long as it doesn't change the actual order things are interpreted in. So this becomes, notice, these two types are the same again. So this just becomes the ID function. So removing parentheses does it change what we think about it? Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. Okay. The, uh, the arrows bind to the right, so this type without the parentheses, and this type with the parentheses are exactly the same. Type safe coverage. Yes. 
but it allows me to, 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 to go, oh, wait, these two types are exactly the same. So I just have something that's taking an X and returning an X. Well, that's identity. <laughs> so now we have sort of this situation here. We now actually have two of these monads. So we can actually start comparing and contrasting them. And you know that we got the set of functions reader implements and a set of function state implements. And there's two specifically that are the same between them. There are all these that are different, right? And it's the, the difference ones out here that will become interesting. That defines why um, particular, this monad versus that monad is actually worthwhile. But this shows up, we have a problem here. And we have two different functions, we have two different bind functions. One, pardon me, one for reader and one for state. And two different return functions. Haskell actually does not like this. As a, as a you know, it, unless you do it the right way. Mm -hmm. Haskell will sit there and go, why do you have multiple functions? And you'll have all sorts of fun importing stuff and so on. The solution, how you do this, is that you use a type <coughs> class. So type classes are, again, something a little bit different in Haskell than in most other places. So I actually want to take a little time and explain type classes, because this is important. Type classes are kind of like interfaces in Java, in that you have you define here are a set of operations, and every type that implements the type class has to implement those operations. Um, so, and they are implemented as you just pass a, you know, in, in Java or in C++, you have, you have the concept of a B-table. So every object has, that has virtual methods attached to it has a B-table, which is just an array of the function pointers for, that implement all of your abstract, all of your virtual functions, right? We're going to play, a, it, it's implemented exactly the same way in Haskell. You're in, implemented as a, an array of function pointers. Except there is a difference. It's associated with the type and not the object. Do you have a question? If you use kind of list, I, I wrote uh, something called interface pressing style and uh, inter this interface library is that, well, it's used to put a type Yeah, um, probably something very similar to that. Um, it's not going to be identical because Haskell uses the type to figure out which table of, of, of function pointers to pass in. It's not associated with a particular object, it's associated with a type. And the compiler decides at compile time which type, which, which, function, which set of functions to pass in. you have a question? Uh, are these analogous to Go interfaces? I think so. Yeah, I think very similar. I don't because really the check know. Because the check is that I compile time that the, yeah. uh, the interface or the type class has available all the methods to satisfy it. But you yeah. have, there's no place where you say, OK, these, these functions are the ones. But Haskell, you do yeah. have to say that. Yeah, Haskell, you do have to it's explicitly explicit. say it's this not, type. It's not structural. It's not all. Yeah. But um, if there are multiple, I, I feel funny saying multiple arguments after all this speech, but what happens then? <laughs> <laughs> Do you pass in multiple tables? Um, no, because it only passes in the table for the type. Which one? Um, it doesn't. Types? Well, in this case, I mean, you can have you can have functions that take multiple different, um, you know, multiple different. Um, you can have. Well, Pine has two arguments. Oh yeah, but the the argument the type will be reader or state. When I say it's based on the type, it's at, at that level, not not reader A, but the fact that it's a reader of any type All right. means it will get the reader's bind and the reader's return. And if it's state, it will get state's bind and state's return. Right? So I do explain this a little bit more. You know, but it's, it's based on the types, not the, the objects. Was was like C++ and Java, you actually need to have an object to have the vtable to, to call the virtual functions on. Here, we will simply have the vtable as passed in as an extra hidden argument by the compiler, basically. So how we declare a type class is fairly stripped down syntax. We just go class here to 
say we're declaring a type class. The monad, the capital M monad, that's the name of the type class we're implementing, right? There are two functions. Our type class defines two virtual functions, bind and return, right? And M is our stand-in, going to be our stand-in type for either, we will be replacing it in this example with either reader R or state S. And this will make more sense in a bit. And thank you for the people who actually know Haskell for not actually using the K word at this point in time. I don't want to introduce that concept. M is just going to be our stand-in for the rest of the type. So notice it's an MA here. <coughs> So M is going to be sort of a, a higher kind of type. Yes, I used the K word. <laughs> An interesting thing here, this is where having it bound to the type instead of the object is important. You might want to notice the return function takes an A and it returns an MA for whatever M we're defining the implementation for. But we don't have an M kicking around to get the virtual table off of. We're creating one. It's only our return type. It's not any of the inputs. It's only the return type has the monad associated with it. And because it's associated with the type, this works just fine. Okay, so you can give like overload constants. Yes. So implementing um, monad class involves writing this too. Yeah. It's just literally be um, well. Ask and you shall receive. Right. Okay. <laughs> implementing the monad class. Implementing a monad requires. Right. Yes. Yeah. So we want to implement the type class here. Let's just implement it for our reader class. Right? So we do instance, which says we're declaring an, an implementation of a, of, of a type class. This is the type class we're implementing. And note that in this implementation, the top level type, we were talking about MAs and MBs. Here, M is going to be replaced by reader R. So for any type of reader we want, here is our reader R implementation. And note, again, these, are these parentheses, you know, the, the, the way things are parsed, it doesn't change. So I can sit here and I can go, this is a open parentheses reader R, closed parentheses A. Well, that's just the same as reader RA. I can ditch the parentheses, and it doesn't change how stuff is how stuff is parsed, how stuff is interpreted. So I can just drop the unnecessary parentheses around reader R, and I get back exactly the same type signature we had before. And so I'm not actually going to implement the bind function. It's exactly the same as before. Right. And the exact same thing happens here with reader, with, with, with return, right? So the M gets replaced with reader R. So drop the unnecessary parentheses and we have a reader R A. And again, this is exactly, would have been actually fewer characters to just replace it with the body in this case, but it's the same, it's ID. If you spell out what reader R A is, if you remember reader is itself a type alias, if you spell that out, it becomes obvious. You can do exactly the same thing with our state monad, right? Except now we're replacing M with state S instead of reader R. That, you know, that's just where we stick the, the state S in. Types drop the unnecessary parentheses, and the values, we, the implementations are exactly the same as before, right? So a nifty feature of type classes that actually makes this nice. So if I do a type alias new R gay, I can sit there and I can switch back and forth and go, I'm not sure which one I want. Maybe I want a reader, maybe I want a state, depending upon how I do, and, you know, depending upon how stuff breaks. Well, if I just have, if I define a type def of new R gay, I can switch that back and forth between state. And note, foo doesn't change. I don't have to change foo at all to change which monad I'm actually using. Is baz actually going to be up? I have to change baz. I have to change where I'm calling foo. But everything in between, 
I can just write in this very generic style and go, I'll fill in the details later. That's only true as long as you don't provide uh, signatures, right? Yeah, if you don't, yeah, that's exactly why we don't want to have people knowing how we actually implement the monad. Because we may be changing the monad out from rely on type inference. If yeah. you were to say, oh, let me be specific, you know, like then, then you prevent that thing from becoming well, this is, this is, you know, I, 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 you know I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm explicitly stating my types here. So, I have two different type defs. I'm switching back and forth between here. What does a new R game mean? Is it, a, is it a reader monad or is it a state monad? So, that's the, that's where I'm, that's where I'm doing the change. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. So this is actually one of the places where we start getting an advantage out of using monads that we don't have, other than just making it look nicer based on our, our beliefs. Right? So we actually do have a fairly nice result here. And I want to break for just a moment because I need something to drink. So we are going to take a very short intermission and grind things out. Has this Marco Rubio moment? <laughs> you know, you can keep okay, going. Can, can I just do the one last one more section because it's the one everybody's been waiting for? Um, it's really up to the Google folks. To the Google folks. I suppose we can stop here because you've gotten a pretty good idea of what a monad is. I'm just going to do the one monad everybody. Okay, we're we're like past time. Yeah. Okay. Do you need me to push all right? Can I do the last part just like really quick? Okay. Go at speed? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, because this is the one everybody's been waiting for. <laughs> the monad that you pretty much hit immediately. You go, how do I write hello world in Haskell? Well, welcome to the IO monad. Right? So the IO problem is Haskell is a lazy language. By which I mean, stuff only gets evaluated when it absolutely needs to get evaluated, no sooner, and only if it needs to be evaluated. So that means the only way to make sure expression A is evaluated before expression B is to make <coughs> expression B actually depend upon the result of expression A, right? But the problem is, I.O. has ordering dependencies, not data dependencies. Right? I print the prompt, enter your password, and then I read to the next line. Those have ordering dependencies. I need to do print the prompt first before I read the, the password. Otherwise, the user won't know what the heck is going on. But there's no data dependency there. Right? Because printing a prompt doesn't produce any data. Any interesting data anyways. So the, the solution, the IO, the solution Haskell has hit upon was well, you represent the ordering dependencies as explicit data dependencies, right? You just have every IO, every function to, that does IO or other real side effects just takes a special value and returns a special value, right? The value represents conceptually the state of the world, right? <laughs> so by taking the state of the world, we're so, saying we're explicitly going we depend upon the state of the world and of all the IOs that have happened before us. And by returning a new state of the world, we are saying we've changed the state of the world and all the IOs after us have to be executed after we're executed, right? So Haskell gives this magic, magic value, the type world pound. The pound just mean, it just tells the compiler, don't screw with this type, you don't That's know what it is. Haskell. Yes, that's actually, that is actually the, the Haskell type, right? So now we can write put string, which just prints a string out, and it takes a string and our value of the world, and it returns no data, it returns a unit, which is the equivalent of void in Haskell, and an updated world. And we've changed, by doing this, we were saying we've changed the state of the world by printing something to the screen, which is causing you know, photons to be emitted. And, and likewise, we can do get line, takes the state of the world, and changes the state of the world because it's right to some input. 
and it returns the, the line input and an updated state of the world, right? So the problem is we now have to pass the state of the world around. We're not only passing it into all of these functions, we're returning updated states of the world and it's got to all be threaded correctly, right? Where have we seen this problem before? <laughs> Type IOA is just literally the state monad that we've already developed in the last example, except we're just passing around the magic world value. <laughs> so that allows us to make much cleaner, much nicer types. Yes, go ahead. But, but, but now, Haskell is a completely imperative language. <laughs> yes, and it's the nicest imperative language I know. That's right. <laughs> but, I mean, just, you so, know, I don't know if you're going to say this, but, yeah. Um, so we have, it's you know, put string then function. just becomes, it takes the string to read and returns IO unit. Get line just re is, returns IO string, etc. So right? the um, world pound doesn't actually change, right? Yeah. Actually, it's just interp internally, it's just represented as a unit. But what if you want to change the state of the world? Well, that's what it actually does. Because yeah. it, it, it's, it, yeah. by taking a world pound, that means you're changing the state of the world outside the program. Ah. And by returning the world a new world pound, that means you've changed the state of the outside it does world. A new world. Yes, right. it does return a new oh, world. I know it's not yeah. It's not the same as what it's not. Yes. Okay. Conceptual. Yeah. So that's that's it. Okay. Now I understand. <laughs> If you guys want to find out how the bar monad is implemented, <laughs> you can find out at McKenna's. It's on uh, 8th Avenue and 14th. Between 8th and 7th, yeah. Right next to the subway, so easy after you learn that and you can uh, learn how to use the MTA uh, monad on your own. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank